Hello and welcome to the DIF, the Ellen McCarr Foundation's online interactive event series that aims to shift mindsets and inspire action towards the circular economy. And this is the November edition, the largest edition of DIF in 2019. So welcome to the very first session of this event. My name is Seth and I've got the pleasure of being the host and I guess conversation leader for the next 30 to 45 minutes or so but you can have a massive influence on the questions I ask. And you can do that by posting your comments or direct questions in a few different places. So there's, there is a comment space next to this video on the thinkdiff.co website. You're also welcome to post those uh, direct on the YouTube channel. And you can do it by uh, sharing uh, on Twitter using hashtag thinkdiff. Um, so this morning, today, or this afternoon, this evening, depending where you are in the world, um, we're all very aware of the need to transition from fossil fuel energy sources to renewable forms of energy. But what about the world of materials? We have very similar challenges in terms of the finiteness of fossil fuel sources and our need to explore new biosources for materials. And it's actually quite a complicated or can be seemingly a quite a complicated and tricky subject. But fortunately today I'm joined by four people from a company for whom this is central to their mission, Bloom Biorenewables in Switzerland, and they're going to clear a few things up for us and uh, explain some of the work they're doing. So today I'm joined by uh, the CEO, Remy, COO, Florent, Head of Production, Chloe, and CSO, Jean, and we'll be uh, introducing those guys individually um, as we go. But I wanted to start with um, you, Remy, if possible, um, and I wanted to try and set the context for this conversation. Why... Why are we talking about this today? Why are we? Why do we need to think about a new source of materials? Yeah, sure. So, hi everyone. My name is Remy Buza. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Bloom, and it's a pleasure to be here today. So, I think you, you gave a very good introduction in in the sense that petroleum is not just uh, something we burn in our cars or in our planes, but it's also what makes up most of the objects that we have around us and. And this fraction is actually non-negligible. So we have actually a, a similar problem as we have with the fuels, but that has much less um, attention from, from the public. And in fact, we see this as a major issue because it's much harder to replace <coughs> this type of petroleum than it is to replace the fraction that we use uh, to harvest energy. Because Sorry, Remy, can you just give us an example of a couple of, of those materials, just so that people know what we're, the ballpark where we're talking about? Yeah, sure. So, so I mean, all the plastics that, that we have today are, are made of, of petroleum. I mean, uh, a lot of, of things you don't see, like uh, glues that would be in particle boards, for instance. So a lot of the furniture... Uh, seems like being made out of wood, but it always has a fraction of, of uh, petroleum. And, and in fact, this fraction is uh, stuck into the furniture for the, the time where you use your furniture, but at the end of life, this fraction will be released. So it's a bit the same as for fuels, this carbon will end up uh, in the atmosphere. And we, we need to find renewable solutions to uh, replace these materials in order to ensure a carbon neutral uh, society. And um, so, you know, we, we've done a piece of actually just released at the foundation a piece of research about um, climate change. And in that research, the kind of one of the headline figures or the headline figure perhaps is that 45% of greenhouse gas emissions actually come from the way in which you produce and make things, um, like buildings and cars and clothes, et cetera, which is, you know, a lot of that's based on um, the material sources that we have. What's the, I mean, is, is, this, is this a reaction to, is this a, basically a strategy for mitigating climate change, I guess is my question. Uh, yes, so, so what we do is we, ultimately remove the, the last carbon footprint that is found in these objects. That means that we uh, make the carbon that is contained in them green itself. But the, the, the emissions that are linked with these materials are also 
uh, coming from the, the production uh, means and we uh, being a, a, a young process, we actually build in by design uh, the, the concept of being as uh, carbon neutral as possible during the production uh, process as well. So it's really the, the, the aim is, is to mitigate climate change and, and, and we have to find these solutions uh, until the last mile, meaning the carbon that is in, in these objects. So, okay, so I think I'm starting to understand this notion that, um, you know, actually a, a lot of the materials around us are sourced from fossil fuels and we should think about how we source materials differently. What, um, so what does, actually, what does this actually mean? What does Bloom Biorenewables actually do? So yeah, yeah, I can take over here. So, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm Florent, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bloom. Uh, and what we aim to do is really make biomass a true alternative to petroleum. So the point is today, renewable solutions are just too expensive because the, the processes to make renewable products are not efficient enough. They are not cost competitive. So what we try to do and what we aim to, to do in the near future is to build um, an efficient uh, uh, bio refinery. So uh, what is a bio refinery? We, we just we can make the, co the comparison with uh, oil refineries. So you have crude oil coming in. It's uh, it's a complex mixture and is refined by distillation to different products. For instance, jet fuels, marine fuels, uh, gasoline or other chemicals. And then you can sell those all those products and nothing is lost on the way. It's very efficient and that's why all those products from oil are so cheap. So now if we want to make a bio refinery, we just do the same thing, but instead of taking crude oil, we take biomass and we bring it into this bio refinery and we have to isolate each of, of the compounds to make different products. But here it's much more complex because we don't have a liquid, we have a, a complex mixture of polymers. So there is cellulose that everybody knows, but there is other main fractions like lignin or hemicellulose. And you, you might not know those fractions because up to today, they are not valorized and they are not on the market. So that's why people don't know about it. And, and the key is biorefineries today, uh, they just manage to extract cellulose in most of the cases, but they don't manage to extract the other fractions such as lignin, we, which acts as glue inside the, inside the biomass. So we realize that if we want to make this process cost competitive, we should not focus only on one of the fractions, but we have instead a need to valorize all the fractions. And we our first focus uh, here uh, um, at Bloom, but also together with our partners at TPFL and the group of uh, Professor Lita Bacher is uh, working on the lignin. And we manage actually to extract both cellulose as people were doing before, but as well extract lignin. And we extract a very pure lignin, which is not decomposed during the extraction process, which was the case before. So now at the end of the day, we end up with several fractions and we can sell all those fractions to make bio-based products. And since we valorize almost 100% of the plant, uh, we are getting more efficient and more cost competitive and we can really be competitive with uh, petrol-based products. You, so you've exposed me and maybe other members of the audience in that I'm ignorant of what lignin is or certainly was until this um, conversation. Um, for any, I mean, like, uh, so I understand you said it sort of acts as the glue within biomass. I guess that uh, that sort of raises two questions with me. What are we literally talking about when we say biomass? I mean, what kinds of things make up biomass, and and is lignin in, in all of those things? Oh yeah, yes, exactly. So so I didn't want it to get too technical, but yeah, I think saying that lignin is a glue is, is already enough. But the, the complex thing is that since lignin is a glue, as soon as you remove the cellulose. Lignin is just condensing to itself and forming something which you can only burn basically because it's, it's complete, completely degraded. So what we, what we do is we manage to uh, use a very simple strategy to stabilize that lignin and then uh, extract it. And this lignin is in any kind of, of, of biomass, uh, uh, but maybe I can leave Jean saying a few words because Jean is our CSO and he's really the expert uh, uh, in, in all the kind of biomass we, we use. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. So as Florent said, uh, I'm Jean, I am the CSO of Bloom. 
and uh, about the question concerning uh, biomass, we are really focusing on lignocellulosic biomass. And this term is actually the name given to plant dry matter that contains cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. And this very typical structure gives a uh, big rigidity to the plant. And we find this biomass in the hard part of the plant. So typically, we have the stem, so for example, the wood. But we, for example, can also take a kernel. So here I have a peach pits. So that's the kind of biomass we can use. We can also use shells from nuts. So here I have hazelnut shells. And uh, yeah, also for sure uh, wood uh, pellets. Uh, <clears throat> so what's very interesting in lignocellulosic biomass, first of all, it's very abundant. So there is a lot of biomass uh, on Earth, and it's currently underused. Secondly, this biomass is non-edible, so it will not enter in competition with human nutrition. For example, if you take a corn or other crops, uh, there will be a competition between bio-based products and human nutrition. Here, you don't enter in this kind of competition, so it's very sustainable. Um, yeah, and that's it. And so, so your your basically biomass is everywhere. Yeah, um, that's what I sort of understand from what you're yeah. saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and so there's an, there's abundant sources. I mean, anything from a hazelnut shell to a to a bit of tree wood or whatever. Mm -hmm. Where I mean, so I guess that what what sort of products can you make out of hazelnut shell, for example? What what types of materials or things? What kind of applications might people see in the future or now? where they, the, the source has been a hazelnut shell. Yeah, so for example, so as Florent told, we are really good in uh, separating all the fraction of hazelnut shells, for example. So you take hazelnut shells and you end up with cellulose from hazelnut, hemicellulose and lignin. If you take cellulose, for example, you can transform it into textile uh, to do some clothes. Uh, you can also degrade it to glucose to be a sugar source in, for in all the fermentation process, for example, to do drugs uh, or any type of other chemicals. Hemicellulose, it's a bit the same story because it's also a sugar-based polymer. So you can depolymerize it into its constituent sugars to synthesize uh, chemicals and feed uh, fermentation uh, reactors. And finally, you have lignin, which has a very unique structure in plant because it's composed of aromatic building blocks. And what's very interesting is aromatic units are one of the most used units in the chemical industry. So if what we are, yeah, what we are doing is we are really uh, extracting those aromatic building blocks uh, and we can then use them in the chemical industry to synthesize a lot of different uh, objects around us. So we can do uh, textile, nylon, for example, we can do fragrance, aromas, we can do paints, we can do materials as polymers, plastics. So there is really a wide range of application. And what we are very uh, doing is like taking all those fraction to so that we can use them as starting material in the chemical industry. So just as like with crude oil, maybe a lot of people won't actually know how many different products oil goes into. And yeah. you know, it's quite well known that it goes into plastics, I suppose. Yeah. But maybe the fact that Remy brought up earlier that it went into glue, for example, is less less widely known. And it seems like it's similar with the work you're doing in the sense that um, these, are, as you kind of described, these are the building blocks that go into different yeah. applications. Yeah. It's, I I oh, sorry, go on. If you. Yeah. No, it's very wide. Like, as you said, like plastics, glue, pesticides, drugs everything around them, basically. I think what we can say is we really look at uh, biomass like they looked at petroleum a hundred years ago and, and we want to, you know, start from the biomass because if you l look at where petroleum comes from, it's nothing else but biomass that has gone, undergone a, a chemical transformation over millions of years. And we know basically enough chemistry today uh, to bypass uh, this uh, long period that petroleum needed and use directly biomass to actually make the, the, the objects around us. Right, so it sounds, so at the moment it's sounding really quite terrific. It almost seems like we should have, uh, we should be doing this at scale already. It's, it's, it's almost puzzling. I guess 
one of the things that I'm thinking about as a potential, potentially a challenge, but I'd be interested to get your perspective on it is the sourcing of this. So biomass is everywhere, but it seems like the sourcing of it is slightly more complex and challenging than oil, which is in a, in a hole in the ground that you can take out in, in a big place, you know, wouldn't, you know, build a refinery or an extraction plant next to it. And that is a question that people have about bio materials in general. Does it, does this mean, for example, having to use up a lot of land to grow biomass? How, how can we be assured that we get enough biomass to produce materials at the scale that we can do now currently with fossil fuel based materials? So, yeah, I, I think Jean mentioned that before, but first we are not using food resources, which are very land intensive and uh, we are focusing on waste. So, I mean, you will be surprised that how many people around here are looking for, for ways to valorize the waste because waste management is really a big problem. So here we are finding a, a new process uh, which can valorize the waste. So since we are taking waste, this is not such a, a major challenge. And also our process is very versatile. So we don't need to focus only on one feedstock, for instance, uh, soft wood or as a nutshell. Uh, our process uh, can accommodate many different types of, of linear cellulosic biomass feedstock. So we can run on one feedstock, which is abundant for a while, and we can go to, to seasonal feedstock as well. So uh, according to our, our, our uh, uh, calculations, we really uh, don't, don't foresee any major uh, problem to, to source this, uh, this, those waste. Yeah. A couple of great questions coming in online. Um, so thank you very much to our audience for those, and I'll get those through to the team very shortly. That was very helpful, Florian. I guess uh, just to clarify what you were saying there, you need, presumably you need some kind of purity in terms of like you, you couldn't have like a huge different range of biomass feedstocks all mixed together. Is that is that what I'm taking from your response? But you could put the same, like you could have nuts one week and then um i don't know i'm trying to think what the other examples were wood chips the next is that yeah. is that correct yeah that's yeah. correct yeah excellent um and uh one other question from me i suppose is um who do you need to work with to make this happen we've got a question actually online which might relate to this um which is from jennifer and she asks what recycling facilities need to be in place in order to process biomass based products textiles packaging etc etc um, industrial composting, she also mentions. What, so, so how much is this? Is this all going through Bloom Biorenewables plant or what sort of infrastructure needs to be built around it that's potentially distinct from what's already in place? Yeah, so our process needs uh, its own plant and, and what we foresee as in, in the near future is to actually um, collaborate with people having a side stream, like people producing hazelnuts that end up with these shells. They don't know what to do with them or they burn them today. And we could just put basically our uh, plant next to it, which would uh, solve the problem of, uh, you know, collecting and, and all this because as these shells are, are already there. And I think, you know, in, in matters of how to collect this biomass, there are a lot of things in place, for instance, in the forestry uh, industry where such plants like the bloom plant would work, work already uh, since uh, hundreds uh, of years. And uh, you have to imagine this a bit in the same way. So we would have a centralized plant and uh, focusing on, on one or the other feedstock and it's, it's not really like a biomass that you would get from uh, the consumer that would have to be recollected, like compostable type of, uh, of biomass. So I don't know if that re um, replies to Jennifer's question, but... I hope Let us know if that hasn't helped you, Jennifer, but I, hopefully that was, uh, hopefully that was uh, responding to your question. I, actually, you've just touched on something there, Remy, that I think is kind of always a topic in this area which is because you mentioned compostable there we've been talking about bio biodegradable biosource biomass uh it seems like there's a kind of definitions problem in this space or challenge at least uh and often we see you know there's there's new biodegradable solutions that come on the market that kind of promise to be the solution or the the alternative and when you dig a little deeper into them they they're less um 
less uh, miracle solving or less of a silver bullet than perhaps they might have seemed in the first place. What uh, it'd be useful if we could establish exactly what we're talking about in the case of Bloom Bar and Renewables. Are we talking about things that are biodegradable, that a uh, product that I could just chuck on into my garden when I'm finished using with it? Uh, what are we talking about exactly? Yeah, so, so this is, it's a big topic at the moment, especially in the light of circular economy. And I think, you know, what we focus on is on sourcing. So what we do is we make sure that humans can convert biomass or, or wood to make it uh, simpler to, to a product that we can use and that we generally make from petroleum today. And these products can be biodegradable, like you can actually make biodegradable products from petroleum. A lot of people are, are not aware of this. So th this is really two independent uh, features. Now, our perspective is a bit, also what we see from the industry is that uh, the biodegradability is maybe less kind of attractive in, in, in some ways than we thought at the beginning, because uh, you, you would basically push a bit the consumers to think, oh, we can just toss this uh, somewhere on the street because it's anyway going to degrade by itself. And uh, this is something that is clearly not improving compared to if you put it in the right bin. And, and uh, the, the other thing is a bit uh, biodegradable products uh, often cannot give the same performance because in the end, you want them to be uh, basically breakable by natural um, uh, forces. And, and that means that if you want to package something in this, you will have a limit in time. And, and this balance is always difficult to, to find. So what we see is, is uh, the, the world is really moving towards a few polymers or a few uh, materials that can be recycled very well. And, and we try to embed basically in, in this uh, movement and, and also use the, the methods that are already available uh, out there to uh, really recycle uh, the things in a loop. And uh, the, just, that just made me reflect a little bit on something that Florin was saying earlier. So we previously at DIF have had Janine Benyus, um, sort of founder of the concept of biomimicry, nature inspired by design, speak at the DIF. One of the things she said in that session was, that there's only something like five polymers in nature. And it sounds like um, the way in which uh, Bloom Bio Biorenewables works, like going back to cellulose, lignin, it's kind of an advantage from a recycling point of view because you're going down to the core building block ingredients rather than in the context we have now, we might have a huge number of different types of plastic or other kinds of materials and trying to work out how to sort all those out and turn them back into something valuable is a bit of a, is a, is a logistical and um, technical challenge. Is that an advantage that you have with biosourced or biomass materials, sourced materials? Yeah, so the key here is that really uh, we have so much freedom because what we are doing is uh, deconstructing biomass and we isolate each of the building blocks. And then we have a lot of freedom because we can build anything from that because we have this uh, these small uh, building blocks. It's like, like a building game, basically. And then we can make, again, existing products, like existing plastics. We can build them again using our building blocks. But then we have a new toolbox with those building blocks, so we can even build new things uh, with new properties and even better properties than what have been done before with, with oil. So I would say definitely that uh, it, it's really a, a good opportunity. We've talked quite a bit in big picture terms. You know, we talked about the big potential of, of this material sourcing and some of the big ideas. Um, I'm also interested to know what's actually happening at Bloom now. Um, you know, what what work are you actually doing? What scale are you working at? Uh, we obviously, we've got a nice, we seem to be, uh, we have a setting today where you guys are based in, in I guess, your lab or a mm, part of your lab. Correct, yeah. So what what is Bloom today? So uh, just to, to come back a bit to uh, uh, three years ago, when we started to develop the process uh, on the gram scale. So this was really R&D with, uh, with academic, academic focus. And uh, uh, during the, the past years, we managed to scale up the, the process to, to the 10 liter. And maybe it's a good time to bring Chloe into the screen because she, uh, she's just here and she was actually the one doing the, all the work. And basically what we did is, is uh, taking this gram scale to the 10 liter scale 
And this was very good to produce samples to distribute to our partners and, uh, and potential customers. And also to really show that the technology is that simple that we can uh, scale by the factor thousand uh, within a, a year. And now the next step is even to, to go uh, bigger. So the good news is that we just secured some uh, funding to scale up the process up to 500 liters uh, together with a, a partner uh, here. And, and, and the goal is really to show that the, the technology can be de-risked uh, at this level. And also we're gonna be delivering uh, larger samples to potential customers to really uh, move one step closer to, to the market. So just to remind our viewers, Chloe is head of production at, uh, at Bloom. Um, and so you, you mentioned the 500 litre plant that you have approval for. What scale did you say you're working at now and, what, and, and how does that actually work? So hi everyone. Um, so what we're doing is quite simple for now. Uh, I mean, we spend a lot of years uh, finding the, the good uh, ingredients, I would say, like in a receipt for kitchen. And uh, we are doing it now uh, in the lab. And as Jean, Jean showed before, we're just taking some wood and we will add uh, some solvent, very specific solvent. And we're gonna eat and stir for like three or maybe more hours. It just depends on what we want at the end. And then we can separate the fraction of the wood. So as we said, it's like, for example, cellulose. So after the eating is done, we will filter the, the mixture we have and we will recover cellulose. And then, then we can use for textile or um, any application that John mentioned before. And we will have another fraction, which is a liquid. And basically in this liquid, we will have any cellulose and lignin and then to remove lignin uh, as a powder we're gonna make a chemical treatment and we will end with lignin as a powder very clear powder we can have a different color it's dependent of the wood and uh, the recipe we use and then we can use uh, hemicellulose and lignin as a different fraction um, as Jean mentioned before, the different application we, we want to go to. So it's quite simple. <laughs> it's, well, it sounds uh, <laughs> simple enough in terms, I'm sure it's very simple for you guys. Um, just to be clear, do you, are you guys selling that lignin to partners or partnering with people in terms of the lignin as the base product? Or then are you doing, are you also then doing whatever's the next phase of, 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 you know what that lignin turns into. Maybe, yeah. So so basically, we, we are doing, the answer is we are doing both. So the lignin we have is is really unique. Uh, without going to too many details, is highly soluble. The molecular weight is very interesting. So already we see people want to work with this lignin uh, for many applications. So we can already sell this lignin. But why this lignin is unique as well is because its potential to be transform to uh, other molecules is also unique with very high yield and selectivities. So what we are doing also here is converting this lignin, doing a depolymerization to make aromatic molecules. And this is, for instance, how we make uh, molecules for the fragrance and the flavor industry. So we take this very long polymer and then we just cut the, the, the bonds at the right positions and we make those aromatic molecules. So we can sell both the lignin and the product from the lignin. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's uh, clear. And I guess that kind of uh, relates to a bit of a question that we've had online from James on Twitter. And he's asked, where would, where would you ideally imagine Bloom Renewables to be in, let's say, 10 years? Are you guys the building blocks kind of creator? Are you uh, working with plants at different, fact you know, you've talked a bit about the hazelnuts factory where maybe you're, you're based there and you're collecting all the source there and several other places. Are you creating the products? What's the what's the kind of long play of this? No, yeah. So, so our purpose really and our vision is is to redefine a bit how the chemical industry is is thinking. And actually, what we do is provide tools so that you can use materials that are better for the environment, that are ubiquitous, that you know can be seen as waste or we like we prefer to call them side streams 
and uh, our our view in 10 years is really to have achieved basically um, uh, this movement within the chemical industry where uh, basically we have uh, collaborations with big chemical groups with whom we are we are even uh, talking already today and uh, basically be able to provide this technology we are developing here at the moment uh, to to have a, a large impact and now maybe to you know kind of also uh, keep what we love doing is playing around with these building blocks we we have a, a few elements that we really like to to uh, play with and we develop new materials uh, and and this is something we will keep on doing so basically we will license technology to a large scale and on a, on a, a smaller activity we will be uh, continuing to to produce materials from from uh, on the basis of these building blocks i wanted to ask a question um, so we've had speakers in the past uh, last year i remember a speaker saying you know everything is chemistry um what sort chemistry. of yeah <laughs> uh i thought you'd agree with with that sentiment um what what sort of reaction have you had from from I don't know, the big players in the mainstream chemists chemical industry are, are they you know cautious with you or are they super optimistic and engaging what what's the kind of vibe um around this sort of area yeah so i think from the chemical point of view the the chemistry is very nice so people like the 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 aspect or the the reflection behind what we are doing and 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 the way actually it 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 works but now what, what the what happens when you try to move a large industry like the chemical industry is you bump into uh, the type of reflection where people say look if you can fit into some stream that makes me uh, not have to invest a cent and use the, 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 the typical crackers that are used for uh, the petroleum-based uh, industry, then I'm, I'm very enthusiastic, but, but you need to basically uh, fit into this. And we know from our chemical understanding and from uh, our vision that this doesn't really make sense for, for the, the impact we are trying to, to achieve because it means basically do incremental uh, improve, improvements. And, and we really believe that we are at a point in time where we need to disrupt uh, the, the way things are, are done. So we see a bit uh, of, of both. So enthusiasts on the chemical side, but we see a bit of, um, I would say, um, troubles to kind of, changed the, the mindset of, of how things have been done uh, up to now. And um, I mean, you mentioned, obviously, you're going to a 500 litre plant. I'm assuming that um, to be as pervasive as petroleum based materials, it's quite a few more millions of litres of production is um, getting buy in from the chemical industry the greatest barrier to scale in your view or are there a number of technical things that still need to be worked out to get to that scale of production so yeah i mean obviously i mean we believe it will be straightforward to scale up the process from where we are now to a commercial plant uh but this is still uh, a lot of work a lot of uh, r d developments but luckily we have some uh, partners which are experienced in in that scale of processes and and the the feedback we have from the scale up we did so far is that everything is going very smoothly and and the key is when we develop that process is we wanted to make sure we keep everything simple without going to fancy hardware or to or to exhaustive chemicals everything is is very simple i mean basically you were surprised that chloe was saying is is very simple but i said that to all the audience if you know to cook pasta you can get a job at, at bloom is is very very easy i mean so, then yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so basically, then, yeah, it, it's it's very easy to scale up, and we believe that it's gonna be as smooth as it was until now to scale up. So, I would say that to answer your question, is that we we don't foresee any large technical challenge to to scale up. And it sounds like then that in terms of scaling up a workforce, or you know, it's not that this has to be conducted by 
once the process as the process is developed it's re replicable by people who are ne aren't necessarily um you know the cutting edge leading chemists in the world per se yeah yeah um i've got a couple of questions in online that i just want to get to um question from our website um do no name left um do petroleum based plastics have a place alongside bio based and where can when can we expect to see price bio based plastics for example being readily on the market so obviously that's a very that's a hot topic i would say in general any any thoughts on that sort of bigger issue yeah, so what we really uh, aim at doing is enabling the sourcing of uh, renewable carbon in biomass and then mimic these uh, plastics that exist today. And, and uh, one uh, scenario is really to have exactly the same plastic that can then basically go alongside, but our vision would be to, you know, replace the petroleum aspects, but in the end, from the material point of view, there would be no uh, difference. So that's a bit from uh, that side, that the price is, is obviously a, a challenging part, and that's actually the core of our engagement or, or what we try to do at Bloom is, is to bring this price down. And, and the reason why if petroleum has an advantage is because they started 150 years ago optimizing processes. So it's, it's not even that it's easier to gain these materials from petroleum necessarily, but it's just that it's an industry that has managed and had time to actually improve the processes over time. And this is something we start now, more or less. So we will need a bit of time, but our models show that we will get there. And, and if uh, society and the companies around the world that have an influence are helping us doing this, we will achieve this in, in the next five to 10 years. That's terrific. And another question um, that's coming from Claire, um, she asked, how, how did you come into this topic? Um, so what, how, you know, how did you, what, it, is that knowledge that goes back academically that things like, you know, it's, how do you start to think, oh, how can we get biomass back into lignin, for example? What, what's the path to getting started with something like Bloom Biorenewables? I know you mentioned it started kind of in a research academic context earlier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So all started uh, at EPFL in, in Lausanne, where there was a, a new research group uh, from uh, Professor Luther Bacher, who really uh, wanted to, to look at biomass from a different angle, instead of focusing on cellulose, which is what people have been doing for many, many years, is trying to look at it differently and say, hey, what won't we focus on something else, on lignin? And then uh, the good timing was that at that point, it was a point that uh, people were understanding better the structure of lignin because of new characterization tools and also because this subject was getting very trendy. And thanks to this very fundamental understanding, uh, um, the group here managed to identify the mechanism how lignin was getting degraded. And since you under understand how lignin is getting degraded, you can really try to find strategies to stop this degradation. And this is exactly what happened. And then the process is you patent, uh, you, you, ask, you, you want to make a patent, you make a publication, and then basically this patent is, is so strong and the technology is so disruptive, and this is feedback uh, we got from the, the scientific community and from the industry, then the, the idea was, okay, it's, it's so hard that we have to bring this to the market, and this is exactly how Bloom was born. It, what, was there a moment when you realized Oh, okay, this is this is actually more than a research project. This is something that um, you know could be a really terrific opportunity to you know start the business that you started now. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the moment is is where you see that there is a technology which is highly disruptive, but it also fits exactly with a market need because you could have a great tech, but if nobody wants what you make from it, it is it's really it's not very useful. But here there was a perfect match between. What the technology offers is exactly what the market uh, was looking for. So this is a moment where you say, okay, this is exactly what you need to make uh, a great business. Um, just looking a little bit at the questions coming in, a question from the Augustone. 
um, that's the username that they've used. Uh, is there any opportunity at all to reuse any substantial petroleum based production assets, crackers, etc., for your process? Someone who likes the technical side, perhaps, of this conversation. In terms of the equipment, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I think, yeah, basically, the chemistry we do is like, uh, it's applied to biomass, but it's chemistry that is very known and very understood. So, and it's a uh, chemistry we can run in already designed uh, equipment. So, yeah, we don't need to reinvent all the technical aspects behind the chemistry because we are not uh, changing the way we are doing process. We are just applying chemistry that we know to biomass. So, yeah. So, so you can you can basically refurbish some of the equipment. Obviously, there will be new parts, but it's not like you have to, you know, uh, break down the the plant to the ground and rebuild everything from scratch. That's I mean, I can see that being a really fantastic opportunity. We actually have a session later in the diff in on decommissioning oil platforms, which is looking at well, you know, as all these plants and refineries are, um, you know have to be wound, wound down as we transition from fossil fuel to renewable energy sources. Um, how do we reuse the um, all the materials and infrastructure that's built in around them in the processes? So it seems that like that could be an interesting topic. Um, another question from the website, which I think is kind of an interesting one is um, from Giacomo, which is how could public institutions help in terms of scaling? And I guess maybe there's a question here, what's the role of policy makers and, and and enabling conditions around policy yeah yes yeah. so this is fundamental in in our endeavor because basically we will not manage alone so we, we need not only the the commercial sector or the industry but also uh, really the the legal framework and and states that actually put uh, uh, energy in in building uh, sort of uh, basically scale up um, uh, centers so that that's typically places where we can go with the technology and rapidly without having to invest in 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 uh, the capex or the, the the equipment be able to to test our process on a larger scale and and these things are, are popping up a bit everywhere in, in Europe there are a, f a few um, already running and I think it's something that is is on a good way and uh, if policymakers are, are listening I think these are, are, are really um, crucial tools for us to to go on the other uh, tools that obviously are, are very helpful are, are funds that are directed to uh, you know kind of this disruptive change uh, that we have in front of us and and there I think the movement is there also, but uh, you know the, the the level of investment is so high that uh, people um, from the industry are very scared or, or um, reluctant to to jump in uh, at the first minute, and and I think this disruption is only possible if if somehow at the beginning these things are um, supported by public and private uh, partnerships. I want to ask you guys, uh, we are pretty much out of time. I want to ask you guys one uh, more question. Well, actually, there's, oh, there's one more question that's just come in line that seems like a useful technical thing to top, um, tap into from Richard, which is what's the, uh, are, are there any issues with toxins in the process? Um, obviously, kind of sounds like you're using, um, you know, biomass and that, that actually there's, there's, that's less of a factor, but interested to hear. Whether, there's, whether you need to add any extra chemicals and kind of that into the materials that you make out of the, the um, lignin, et cetera. And so we are very careful about what chemical we're using and we really like compared to what is going on actually uh, in the chemistry. And we're looking for green and uh, renewable uh, chemicals. Uh, but uh, for now, it's still chemistry. And we need to have in mind that it, it could be our full more dangerous. But uh, we are always looking to have the greenest way of producing our products and to have products at the end that are green and uh, renewable. 
not harmful. I mean, for now, the chemicals that we, um, a lot of people are eating, um, we were talking about the, the petroleum for now, for example, and some aromas or something like that's coming from petroleum. And we're pretty sure that it's more harmful than the things that we can make at Bloom. And yes, yeah, so I was just about to ask my final question before that one popped up, which was, um, you seem kind of optimistic. And I guess that people who are actively able to work on something and, and you know, you can feel kind of empowered by that. Is that fair? I mean, what, what gives you greatest cause for optimism that, um, that, that you're going to continue to see progression with Bloom and that this sort of renewable materials or biosource materials agenda can play a role in mitigating climate change and helping us to meet the goals that we set? Yeah, I think it's pretty easy because uh, we need another carbon source and, and biomass is one of the most accessible and uh, ubiquitous. So we are convinced that even if we don't manage, someone is going to tap into this source because it's like petroleum lying uh, around that we have not the ability to use because we don't have the keys to basically break out the, these molecules. and. And since we know our chemistry very well, we see that we have, you know, this uh, competitive advantage that gives us um, basically the energy and, and the, the, the um, belief or the vision that we have something at hand that can really change the world. And, and I think that's also what drives Bloom in, on a day-to-day -day basis, and, and it will continue to do so for, for the coming uh, years. Well, thank you so much to Jean, Remy, Florent and Chloe for joining me for this session. Thanks so much to our audience for taking the time to watch us and ask your questions and post your comments. Really appreciated those. Uh, but that is it for this session. We have just completed the first session of this uh, diff, which has got more than 50 different events within it. Uh, one starting at 11 o'clock sort of maybe takes a builds on this theme a little bit we're going to be talking about the role of circular economy in tackling climate change and i'm sure we'll be talking about materials as part of that conversation we're actually joined by someone from the uh, materials economics uh, think tank and then at four o'clock today we're also talking about biomaterials a session called the bio conundrum um, bio-based materials in a circular future so we'll be talking again at another angle on this same topic but Thank you so much to the team at Bloom for joining me today. And uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you again over the next five days at the diff.